So aloha, and aloha to you who are online. We're glad you guys are here. Don't forget, there's three ways to support the church financially. Number one, you can use the Yay God boxes out in the lobby, or you can use the online uh, address that's on the screen right now, or you can send it to the P.O. Box, all three of those great ways to continue to support the church financially. We appreciate all your support. Every single penny helps. Well, for the past two weeks, and then today and next Sunday, we're talking about resolve, four things that we need to be resolved about. And so far, we've said one of the greatest gifts God has given us is the freedom to choose, but we often waste that power that God has given us. We've said that to make big, important changes in our life, we need resolve. And of course, this word resolve means to decide. It means to settle, to determine, uh, to have a purpose. To be resolute is to make a firm determination to actually do something. So in this four-part series, we're looking at the four most important resolutions we can make in life. And these are the resolutions that if you make them and keep them with God's help, your life will radically improve. We've said the rest of your life will be the best of your life. And we learn of these four resolutions from the life of Moses. Paraphrase for us in Hebrews chapter 11. Moses made these same four resolutions we're talking about, and making these resolutions altered his destiny and the destiny of the entire Hebrew race. And so we're looking at one of these resolutions each week, and they're listed for us in Hebrews 11, 23 through 27. We've read that a couple of times, but let's just read over it again today. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. You remember the Pharaoh wanted all Hebrew boys to be murdered because he was worried about a future uprising. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He'd been adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter when his mother floated him down the river to save his life. Moses grows up later as an adult. He realizes he's a Hebrew person, but he's been raised as an Egyptian. So he refuses to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he persevered as though seeing him who is unseen. So in this passage, we can see that Moses made these four resolutions. Moses, by faith, refused. Moses, by faith, chose. Moses, by faith, considered. And Moses, by faith, persevered. Because of these four resolutions, God guided his steps as well as the steps of the people that Moses led and cared for. And these four resolutions that Moses made changed all of their lives for the better. And when you and I understand the meaning of these four verbs and their implication for our lives today, thousands of years later, it will still change our lives for the better as well. So in week one, we talked about resolution number one. We're going to put it up on the screen, and would you say it aloud with me? I refuse to be defined by others. So when he was an adult, Moses refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He didn't want to identify with the Egyptian taskmasters anymore. He wanted to identify as the Hebrew slave that he was born into. And then last week, we talked about the second resolution that we all need to make if we want to live the life that God wants us to live. It's on the screens as well. Let's say it aloud. I choose short-term pain for long-term gain. Moses did that. He resolved to live his life as an Israelite slave. He chose a painful life compared to the sinful pleasures of being Egyptian royalty because he knew it was the right thing to do. So he had to refuse and he had to choose, right? And if you missed either of those messages, you can find them on the website, you can find them on the YouTube channel, you can find them on the Facebook page. They're always there, uh, usually within 24 hours after Sunday morning. So let's talk about the third resolution Moses made that applies to all of us as well. Let's put that one on the screen. Number three, say it aloud with me. I consider God's values as greater than that of the world. Let's say that one more time. I consider God's values as greater than that of the world. So I want God's values for my life, not the world's values. That's what Moses did. This is why God used him in such powerful and lasting ways. So just as we saw in resolution number 1 in verse 24 and resolution number 2 in verse 25, we find resolution number 3 in verse 
26. So I want to read that for you again. Moses was considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. So let's talk about that. Here the author of Hebrews is equating Jesus Christ with Moses' experience of God as Yahweh, the great I am that he met in the burning bush on the side of the mountain, right? And this is more biblical proof of the doctrine of the Trinity. Jesus the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, all one. And though Moses at the time couldn't verbalize that he was choosing Christ by name, the author of Hebrews wants us to know, hey, listen, when Moses considered God, he was also considering Christ because they're one. He says, Moses considered and the word he used in Greek is hegeomai. Hegeomai means to lead or to suppose or to determine, among other possible uses of it. So in context, because again, C-I-E, context, is everything, hegeomai refers to leading the way, or it refers to the leading thought in someone's mind, something that's highly esteemed, something highly regarded, something considered as the leading thing, the most valuable thing, the most important thing. So that's the word and that's the real use of what's happening here. This resolution Moses is making is a value judgment. He's clarifying what matters most in his life, what is going to be the leading thought in his mind. And he says it's going to be to follow God's ways, it's going to be to follow God's will. It's going to be to follow God's values, even if doing that brings him some pain or some struggle or some discomfort or some disgrace or some loss of value among the people he interacts with daily, the Egyptians, right? And so even if it costs him a loss of wealth and status, living by God's values is what is of utmost importance to him. God's ways are the leading thoughts in his mind. He's saying, I want your way, Yahweh. See what I did there? And so remember, this is a big deal for Moses. He would have been an heir to the treasure and the power of Egypt as Pharaoh's grandson. He's throwing all of that away because he values God's ways, God's will, God's approval more highly than anything else. And it really reminds me of something that the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians 3. We talked about this a lot several Wednesdays uh, ago on a Wednesday night message. Paul was writing about all of his Hebrew pedigree that he walked away from when he decided to become a follower of Christ. And he recounts all of his status and his influence and his education and his heritage, on and on and on. And then he says this in verse 7, But whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss because of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them mere rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. Now, this word rubbish that Paul uses, it's actually the Greek word skubalos, and skubalos refers to animal excrement. It's, it's a crude word. It's basically the equivalent of our English word crap, okay? And so Paul calls all of this prestige and all of this popularity stuff, all of his connections in his life, he calls it all dog crap compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. So Moses is making this same value assessment as well of his life, the same resolution in his life. He's making the same value judgment. He's saying, okay, I'm going to look at everything there is, and I'm going to clarify what matters most in my life, and I'm going to prioritize the rest of my life's decisions around whatever those core values are. Now, we've been talking about seven core values for our church and for our personal lives on Wednesday nights as well. If you've been missing that, you've been missing this core value uh, discussion. So I want to ask you this question today. What matters most in your life? What matters most in your life? What's the top three, four, five core values in your life? And if we were sitting and having coffee somewhere and I hit you with that question, could you name them off? Bam, bam, bam. These are my core values. What are the most important values in your life? Because I'll say this, if you can't identify them, if you can't name them, then you really can't be sure that you're living by them, can you? If you don't really know for sure what they are. You're not living your values if you can't even name them. 
So here's my challenge for you today. Go home today, and before you go one more day into this year, sit down and say, okay, what's the answer to that question for me? What's most important in my life? What are the top values in my life? And, of course, these lists vary slightly in different arenas of your life. What are your core values for your marriage? What are your core values for your parenting relationships? What are your core values for your personal life? What are your core values for your faith life? What are your core values for your business life or your vocational life? What are your core values for your dating life? What are your core values for your educational life? What are your core values for your leadership life? Think about those things. And then you need to write them out. Because until you clarify them, you can't live by them. And so Moses resolved to consider, to esteem, it was his leading thought that he was going to follow God's values over the world's values. Now, why is this so important? I'll tell you why. It, it's a little secret. If you don't decide what's important in your life, other people are going to decide it for you. Let me say that again because some of you missed the chance to say or type amen, so I'm going to give you another chance. If you don't decide what's important in your life, other people are going to decide it for you. Amen? They're going to push you into their mold, and you're going to end up living for their values instead of your values. So you've got to make the decision. You've got to decide what's most important to me, and then you need to live your life by those values. Whenever a situation, whenever a circumstance comes up, whenever an option comes up, whenever somebody gives you a suggestion, hey, why don't we go do this? You have to stop and say, does that line up with my values of what's most important to me? And if it's not, then say, mm, I'm going to pass on that option. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something else instead. I'm not going to live by other people's values. That's what Moses did. Moses resolved. Let's say it again. We're going to put it up on the screen. I consider God's values as greater than that of the world's. Now, what were the world's values in Moses' time? Well, they're the same values that the world has valued throughout history and has continued to value most highly even up to now in our present time, 33, 3600 years after Moses. Every single advertisement you will see is built on one of the three core values of the world, which we can name as passion, possession, and position. Or we could call them sex, salary, and status. Or we could call them the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the pride of life. They haven't changed in thousands and thousands of years. The world's value system says, I want to look good, I want to feel good, and I want to have the goods, right? I want to be powerful, I want to be rich, I want to have fun. And so we see these values in three verses from our key passage in Hebrews 11. In verse 24, we see the world values popularity, power, and prestige. In verse 25, we see the world values pleasures, all the various pleasures of various sins. And in verse 26, we see the world values possessions, like the treasures of Egypt. And so Moses says, you know what? I'm going to walk away from all of that. I'm going to walk away from all of that. He resolves to walk away from the very things most people spend their entire lives trying to get. We want the world's treasure, we want the world's pleasure, and we want the world's measure of success. And Moses said, I'm walking away from all of it. Pleasure, passion, position, popularity, possessions, no. Instead, Moses resolved to esteem, to consider God's values as far more valuable than the world's values. And again, it was a huge resolution for him because by the world's standards, remember Moses, man, he had it made, right? In the Pharaoh's house, he would have all of these things to the nth degree. There would be no one else wealthier in the world, no one more influential, no one more powerful, no one more highly esteemed, and he walks away from all of it, what, what we might think of as the American dream, right? And he walks away from it. He walks away from what most of us spend our entire lives trying to get. Why? Because he knew it wasn't going to last. It wasn't going to last. Only God and the things of God would truly last. John the Apostle says this, the world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God continues to live forever. That's what Moses understood as well. And that's what Moses resolved to do. It's what you and I need to resolve to do as well. I'm going to do the will of God always instead of choosing the lusts of the world. 
So let's put our first three resolutions uh, together and say them aloud again. We're going to put them up on the screen. Number one, I refuse to be defined by others. Number two, I choose short-term pain for long-term gain. Number three, I consider God's values as greater than that of the world. So if the wise way to live is not by the world's standards or the world's value system, but by God's value system, we have to say, well, then what does God actually value? How can we know that we're valuing, esteeming, considering the right things? Well, these verses about Moses tell us three things that God values. Number one, God values purpose more than popularity. God values purpose more than popularity. You're fulfilling God's purpose for your life. That's far more important to him than you being popular. And again, remember, as big a decision as you might feel this would be for you, choosing always God's purpose over popularity, it was a much bigger step for Moses as Pharaoh's grandson, heir to the throne of Egypt, the most powerful nation on earth at the time. He's a celebrity, he's rich, he's connected, he's influential, he's powerful. Here's something every celebrity will tell you about fame, though. Fame doesn't last. Fame doesn't last. Fame is fleeting. So ultimately, fame is worthless. In the long run, fame is worthless. God's values tell us it's pointless to invest one second of your life trying to be famous because fame doesn't last. Let me give you an example. Does anybody remember who was on the cover of People magazine two weeks ago? No. That's how quickly fame fades. One minute you're the hero, next minute you're the zero, right? Do you remember when you were in high school how important it was for you to be popular? Some of you are maybe still in high school right now, but us old parent, grandparent types, we still remember what high school was like too, and we all wanted to be named one of those positive superlatives in the yearbook, right? Most popular, best hair, cutest couple, best smile, most athletic, funniest, all that stuff. Annette and I were going through some old stuff this week and found all our old yearbooks, and I actually found a list of superlatives from my ninth grade year, my freshman year, and I got voted loudest voice. <laughs> loudest talker. That was me. Loudest talker, even in ninth grade. So do any of those people who voted for you or didn't vote for you, do they actually care about you today? Are you close, close, close friends with all of them? Doubtful. Maybe 40 years later, you're still close to one or two high school friends, but, but probably not most of them. But when you were on campus, you were trying to be big man on campus, or you were trying to be the beauty queen of campus. You wanted to be in the in crowd. You wanted to be popular. And the absolute top admired most popular people from my high school, you know what happened? They graduated and then they went back two years later and they walked around on the campus and everybody there went, who the heck are you? Who the heck are you? Prom king was a total zero on campus two years later. That's how long supposed fame lasted. So don't spend any time trying to win the favor of people who really don't care that much about you. Never waste your time on popularity or trying to be famous because God's purpose, living for God's purpose for your life, is far more important than being popular. God values purpose more than popularity. The second big thing God values is people. People are more valuable than pleasure. That's the second thing. God values people more than pleasure. And so, since Moses considered God's values the most important, he decided that's what he was going to value as well. So he decided freeing those slaves, that's far more important than living the life of luxury and pleasure in Pharaoh's palace. He traded a royal lifestyle in order to help the neediest of the needy slaves. And this is a challenge for us in our life, too, to value other people more than our own comfort, to value other people more than our own pleasure. God's values say we should be helping people around the world who are in poverty, who have disease, who suffer from illiteracy, who are under oppression, who have AIDS, who have COVID, who have cancer, people who are orphans. We could make a long list of people who are disenfranchised, suffering in many of these ways. And you just can't get any more vulnerable than that. We think about people who don't know the hope of Jesus. There's still about 3,000 tribes, 3,000 people groups who have no Christians in them, no church, no Bible in their language. They're all small groups of people all around the world, and they all need care and love and support and medical help and financial help and physical help and spiritual help. They all need Jesus. Amen? 
We have people in our own backyard who are suffering in poverty, children who are hungry. They have so little compared to what most of us have, and we have an opportunity to choose to value them the way God values them. We're actually going to be talking about that on Wednesday nights uh, here soon, starting on the 17th. We're going to do a five-part series talking about how we should value people on that level. And we can choose to go on missions projects. We can do that locally. We can do that abroad. We can choose to live with a little less pleasure. We can choose to live with a little less comfort for a time so that those who have absolutely nothing can have at least the bare minimum of what they need, a little more comfort in their life. We can share the hope of Jesus with them. And we should resolve to do that, to consider God values more than the world's values of popularity, pleasure, and possessions. He values people more than all of those things. And because to God, people matter more than pleasure, and God's purpose is more valuable than popularity. Those are the two things God values. There's a third thing. Peace of mind is more valuable than possession. Peace of mind is more valuable than possession. So you may have a house stuffed full of possessions, and yet if there's antagonism, and anger, and disappointment, and discouragement in the house, you know as well as I do, all that stuff is scubalos, right? It's all worthless. Peace of mind is far more valuable than any amount of possessions. And so where do we get that peace of mind from? It comes from doing the will of God. And of course, the marketing world completely lies about this. It tells us the opposite, right? Advertisements lie. They tell you you can buy peace of mind. If you just have enough money, you can buy peace of mind, but you can't. You know why people buy things? Because it gives us temporary happiness. When you buy a new car, or you buy a new iPad, or you buy a new video game, you love that thing, and man, it's so fun, and you feel good, you feel happy for a while, but after a while, that excitement wears off. It's a boring old video game. It's a beat-up old car, right? The iPad doesn't run as fast as it used to. Why? People change, and things fall apart. So we get bored with these things that fall apart. They don't last. That's why you have to redecorate, too, because you get bored. That piece of art you thought was so cool, that couch you love so much, a couple of years later, ick, right? Can we do something else with this? Can we get rid of this? Can we buy something else? Why? Because possessions don't give ultimate pleasure. They don't last. And they certainly can't give you peace of mind. You can't buy peace of mind. It comes only from doing the will of God. And again, Moses gave all of that up, what everybody else spends their whole lives trying to get, success, fame, uh, power, money, all so that he could do God's will. Because people are more valuable than pleasure, peace of mind is more valuable than possessions, and God's purposes are more valuable than popularity. And so Moses resolved to value only the things God values, and he wanted to value them for sure more highly than the values of the world. And the Bible tells us why. Why would Moses make this decision? He was looking ahead to his reward, it says. And so we need to look forward to our reward as well. Now, the author of Hebrews, he talks about what this reward is for all of us too. He talks about it in the very next chapter, right? So because of Moses and all these many other examples of faith that he's just gone through in chapter 11, in the very next chapter, chapter 12, verse 1, he writes, therefore, we always say, hey, whenever you see a therefore, you got to stop and say, what's that therefore, therefore? Well, he's talking about all of chapter 11, Moses and all of these other great examples of the faith, all of these people who lived faith this way, because of all them, therefore, what's this mean to us? Since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, people who have already completed the life of faith, and they're cheering us on as we do the same. Let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let's run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, Jesus, who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Consider him, 
who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So let's resolve to run the Christian life race with endurance. Let's keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, who, like Moses did, looking forward to our reward, right? That's what the author of Hebrews is talking about. I've given you all these examples of all these heroes of the faith and how they lived their life and the resolutions they made and the choices they made to value the things of God more so than the things of the world. And all that led up to Jesus, who did the same thing. He valued the things of God more than the things of the world. He interacts with Satan, who tempts him for 40 days, and Satan tries to offer him all of these things that the world values, right? And Jesus rejects all of them, and he walks away from that uh, temptation because he is going to value only the things that God values. He endured such hostility to lead the way for us so that we could follow his example, not grow weary, not lose heart. So remember, our vision sets our values. Our vision sets our values. What you are looking at, what you keep your eyes fixed on, determines what you value. If you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, like the author of Hebrews is saying, then Jesus is what you're going to value. If you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, you're going to value G what Jesus values. On the other hand, if we keep our eyes fixed on a catalog or fixed on a shopping website or fixed on an Instagram feed or fixed on a celebrity gossip magazine or fixed on a 24-hour news channel, right, then that's what we're going to be focused on. That's what we're going to value. Our vision sets our values. So let's resolve instead, like Moses, to say this. Here it is on the screen again. Say it aloud with me. I consider God's values as greater than that of the world's. Amen? So we got one more resolution to talk about, and we're going to talk about that next week. So you have to come back for part four. As uh, Joel and Benny come to lead us in our closing worship, let's pray together. Father God, uh, Moses is just one of many examples that we have in Scripture of people who made these same kinds of decisions to value your ways more so than the ways of the world. And they are there as examples to us, as challenges to us. And then, of course, foremost of all, Jesus did the same thing. We're looking at decisions Moses made, but Jesus is the, the king of making the right decisions. And so help us, God, to be inspired by these people who made tougher choices. It's, it's easier for me to, to walk away from, you know, maybe $100 that gets offered to me than the millions of dollars that Moses had to walk away from when he left Pharaoh's palace. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't have to walk away from Jeff Bezos' house or Bill Gates' house, right? I'm not living on that level of luxury. And yet Moses was able to even walk away from something as amazing as that. We don't have to walk away from anything that outlandish, but we do have to make some choices similar to that. Sometimes money's not the right answer. Popularity's not the right answer. We have to say no to those things that maybe our heart kind of wants because we really need to be focused on what you are calling us to do instead, God. So help us be people of faith people who make these resolutions, who make these value decisions. Help us know when to refuse and when to choose and what we should consider most highly. And then help us persevere. We're going to talk about that next week. God, help everyone here today, whatever decisions they're making in their life right now, whatever resolutions they're making in their life right now, whatever things they value as the core values of their life right now, help them uh, focus in on that today and maybe make some tough decisions of some things I need to let go of. I can't hold on to everything, so I'm going to drop these things so that I can hold on to what's most important, what's most valuable in life, the things God values. Help us all make those tough decisions today, Lord, to be resolute in our following of you. That's my prayer for all of us today in Jesus' name.